In this mini tutorial, I'm going to be speaking about selection and acquisition of resources as part of the strategy for collection management. In the literature, the selection of resources is referred to as an art and a science. It's through a combination of knowledge, experience and intuition that collection managers select resources for their collections. There are two main types of selection micro selection and macro selection. Micro selection involves selecting item by item. This type of very hands on selection may not occur very much anymore in large libraries, including public libraries, and even in academic libraries, there are many purchases which are made based on the buying of large data sets in ebook or e serial format. However, micro selection still happens in many school libraries where the collection is small enough to allow mostly micro selection and where the needs are widely varied for a smaller group. Macro selection involves selecting resources on a much broader scale. Through macro selection processes, a library can acquire the bulk of their materials for its collection without having to engage in item by item selection. In the case of new school libraries, macro selection might be used to create the core collection before the library opens. The selection of resources for a collection can be considered to be a four step process. First, we identify the relevant materials. Secondly, we evaluate and assess those materials to decide if they're worthy of inclusion in the collection. Next, we make the decision to purchase the item and then we prepare an order so that the item can be purchased. Let's take a look at the first phase, identification of items, and talk about some of the selection tools that are available to us for micro selection. Reviews are useful tools for micro selection. There are various different types of review sources that a librarian can use in developing a collection. For school libraries, Magpies, Reading Time, the US School Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, Inside a Dog for Young Adult Titles, Booklist, Kirkus Reviews, The Horn Book, and the New York Times Book Review may provide some useful reviews to consider. Not all of these sources are designed as sources specifically for librarians to use. However, there are many library specific sources. These sources include reviews of individual titles, and supplements that outline a good selection of titles in a particular area or format. Other review sources review popular, popular items. There are also sources for retrospective reviews, and these are useful for developing new collections or for targeted development of areas where gaps exist. For example, there is the Book Review Digest and a product, products provided by a company called H.W. Wilson including the core collection catalog. Book reviews are great because they evaluate the material that they review. However, there are a few issues with using just book reviews as a selection tool that you should keep in mind. Firstly, sometimes book reviews are biased and sometimes they're influenced by the forum in which they're published. For example, they may be more about promoting the book and marketing it then evaluating the content, depending on where the review is published and the purpose of the publication. Book reviews also sometimes miss alternative press materials because they simply aren't mainstream enough to get the notice of reviewers. Finally, from a pragmatic perspective, selecting resources item by item based on reading book reviews is an entirely incredibly time consuming process and it may not be a feasible way to develop an entire collection. The use of bibliographies and lists offers another approach for selecting resources for the collection. Often these are subject specific, but sometimes they can be general too. For example, academics in a particular area might produce a bibliography that contains the definitive works on a particular topic. And if you were to go about developing collection in that area, it would make sense to start with a bibliography like this. General lists or databases include things like books in print, and within that, subsets including subject guides to books in print and forthcoming books. There are resources such as Bowker's Complete Video Directory and Books Out Loud for audiobooks, which provide lists of published resources in particular formats. 
However, these are quite expensive and need regular updating. For example, Books Out Loud 2019 costs $1,658, and so most school libraries are unlikely to purchase this type of resource on a yearly basis. Unlike bibliographies, these bigger, more general lists aren't focusing on including resources of a certain quality, so while they'll help you identify lots of items, you'll then need to think about the quality of those items and make a decision on whether you'll select them. Book awards are another really useful tool for identifying materials for collections. In Australia, some that are important include the Children's Book Council of Australia Book of the Year Awards and the Miles Franklin Awards. For school libraries, the Inkey Awards, the Speech Pathology Australia Book of the Year, State Book Awards and the Prime Minister's Literary Awards might also be useful. There are some issues around basing selection decisions on awards that you need to be aware of. Award panels are essentially arbiters of taste and they're making the decision on which book is best in that particular year. This isn't the type of practice that we engage in in libraries. Rather, we aim to provide a well-rounded holistic collection. A book's non-inclusion on an award list is not a reason not to select it. However, where funds are limited, looking at award lists can be a useful starting point for collection development. In addition, there is material provided by other agencies, people external to the publishing process, as well as the publisher and vendor supplied material, which can provide lots of information about particular resources. These include the old publisher blurbs, where we used to get slips of paper that included two or three titles, and we'd cut these up and distribute them around the library for selection processes. We tend to get less of these blurbs these days, but we do still for niche publications or niche publishers. And in schools, we often get catalogues of new titles. Websites and RSS feeds are also useful sources of publisher or vendor supplied material. Finally, visits from sales reps still occur. However, these visits tend to be from vendors who mediate between the library and the publisher, rather than from the publishers themselves. Publisher and vendor supplied material is useful for getting a perspective on what the publisher would like you to know about the resource. They're also useful because they describe the resource, but they, aren't use but they do not evaluate them. Finally, there are a range of internal data sources that can also help to identify items for potential selection for the collection. Demand mon monitoring, or looking at the volume of loans per copy of an item, can assist librarians to make decisions around whether they should purchase additional copies of resources. Similarly, interlibrary loan requests, or requests for purchase, provide an indication of areas in which the collection might need to be further developed. Customer requests for purchases are also a useful way of identifying items on an item by item basis for particular addition to the collection. When you're using any selection tool to identify items for potential inclusion, you should consider the tool itself and how you're using it. Think about why the tool exists. Who has it been created for? How well does the selection tool perform in covering current publishing in a particular area? Are any types of materials intentionally included or excluded from the selection tool? And how does this impact on your use of the tool? What subjects are included in the selection tool resource and is it appropriate for you? What kind of information is offered about the works and how much of it is offered? Is the content descriptive or evaluative? Who has the tool been designed for? For librarians, for general readers, or for subject specialists. All of these things can help you determine which selection tool is best for your library and your context. Let's turn our attention to macro selection. Macro selection is increasingly common in all types of libraries, but less so in school libraries for physical school book collection. Some school systems, however, may engage in macro selection for ebook and audiobook collections, which may be centrally managed for a consortia of schools. Whether or not you are in the immediate position to undertake macro selection, it's still good to be aware of these processes. 
because it offers the capacity to create large orders far more efficiently and it may be necessary if you find work in a larger type of library or if you find yourself one day founding a school library collection from scratch. The first type of macro selection tool are approval plans. Approval plans are based on an established subject profile. Resources are selected based on that profile and then the items or an electronic slip about the item is sent for inspection to the library. If the resource is retained, the item is paid for. Profiles for the selection of resources in an approval plan are updated as collecting priorities change. Blanket orders are another useful tool. Blanket orders allow us to get all resources published by a given author or all titles that, are, that appear on a particular shortlist for an award. For example, if you had a request for anything published by JK Rowling, this could be covered by a blanket order. Similarly, a library might indicate that it wishes to receive five copies of every title that makes it onto the Children's Book Council of Australia shortlist each year. This type of purchasing can be best covered by blanket ordering. Standing orders are probably the most common type of macro selection used in school libraries. Standing orders through companies such as Scholastic or Lamont send a selection of titles quarterly or monthly chosen based upon a set criteria and often they are discounted because the company can purchase in bulk before distributing. School library standing orders often package their books along with teaching notes and reviews to make this style of selection more appealing to time poor teacher librarians or to make selection manageable in libraries where a qualified teacher librarian is not employed. In larger libraries, standing orders are also used to ensure the library receives all copies of books that are updated under frequent edition. For example, an Australian commercial law textbook might be updated annually and the library can put in place a standing order so that they receive the latest edition every time it's published. Macro selection can be done on a grander scale through outsourcing arrangements. For example, libraries may enter into an agreement with a vendor who will do all the selection according to subject-based profiles and supply shelf-ready resources to the library. Materials are selected by vendors and supplied to the library shelf-ready, catalogued, covered, barcoded and RFID tagged. The Brisbane City Council was among one of the first Australian libraries to undertake outsourced selection for collection based upon profiles in this way. So we know that there are a large range of tools to assist us with identifying items for potential inclusion in the collection, but there is another step in the process. The second step is evaluating and assessing these items to determine if they're worthy and appropriate to be included in the collection. Libraries develop selection criteria based on their specific needs and the needs of their specific user groups. Selection criteria include a number of different factors. These are just some of the factors that are included in selection criteria for different types of libraries. What is considered to be desirable for each of these considerations depends on library type and indeed the, user of the, the users of the library. To get a sense of how these criteria are applied, take a look at the collection development policies for various types of libraries and refer to the literature related to selection criteria. These selection criteria from the American School Library Association are more specific for school libraries. Note how they reflect similar themes to the ones previously, but are tailored for the users that the library is serving. There is a focus on supporting and enriching the curriculum and meeting students' personal interests and learning needs. Of course, there is a requirement that the books or resources meet high standards in literary, artistic and aesthetic quality, but also that the books or resources are created well and have a good physical format. It's important that the books are appropriate for the subject area and for the age, emotional development, ability level, learning styles and social, emotional and intellectual development of students for whom the materials are selected. This is an important consideration when selecting items for students as opposed to adult users. 
Of course, it's important that the resources incorporate accurate and authentic factual information from authoritative sources. They also must exhibit a high degree of potential user appeal and interest. They really have to capture the eye of the student and engage them. A well-balanced collection should include items that represent differing viewpoints and provide a global perspective. The items should promote diversity by including materials by authors and illustrators of all cultures. Resources collected for a school library should, be, should represent a variety of formats, both physical and virtual, and they should demonstrate the physical format, appearance and durability suitable to their intended use. School books get a lot of knocking around in school bags and so do library books. It's also important to balance the cost of a resource with the need of it. This is particularly important with school library budgets being tight. Evaluation and assessment is not unique to materials that we purchase for collection. We also need to evaluate and assess gifts and donations and think about their appropriateness for the collection. When we're evaluating gifts and donations, we need to think about whether they fit with the collection development policy guidelines. Sometimes it can be difficult to knock back a well-intentioned donation or gift to the library. However, if you have a well-developed policy, it's easier to show the person who's making the donation the reasons why the, the item may not be suitable for the school library collection. Other things to consider is the condition of the item and whether it is possible to afford the cost of processing. It's not reasonable to accept huge boxes of books and other resources for the library if there's no one available to add these to the catalogue, cover them and make them ready for the shelf. Gifts and donations should be assessed against the same criteria that are used for purchase materials. Once the resource has been evaluated, we then need to decide whether or not we'd like to purchase the item. The third step is making the decision to purchase and for large purchases this often involves documenting the decision. For example, if a library decided to buy a new database then a particular number of evaluations would be recorded and a technical audit might be undertaken as well to ensure the database can work in the operating environment. It's important for accountability purposes that the purchasing strategies are well documented and recorded. Finally, the fourth stage is preparing an order to initiate the purchase of the new collection item and then awaiting its, its receipt.